All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Serverless Working Group update. Uh, Timur and I are going to be talking about two different projects today, cloud events as well as the workflow specification. So, Timur, can you go ahead and share your screen? Because I think we're going to vanish now. All right. Let's go ahead and start the presentation. And here we go. So I'm going to be up first. So let's go to the next slide. Obviously, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about cloud events, give you a quick update. And then the bulk of the talk will be Timur talking about the serverless workflow spec. All right, so first, obviously, cloud events. So just a quick recap. Um, we delivered the latest version of the spec, which is version 101, back in December of last year. Um, same deliverables as before, and I'm not gonna go into what the spec is. I'm assuming everybody understands what that is, or you can go find it. This isn't that kind of call. We're gonna go into deep dive. But just so you understand what the deliverables were, it was obviously the specification itself, the transport bindings, the encoding formats, a primer to give you guidance on why we did what we did, how to use the spec, stuff like that, and a whole bunch of SDKs to help you get started with cloud events. Okay. Now, in terms of what's coming up next for the cloud event spec itself, to be honest, not a whole lot. We are doing some minor bug fixes that people find, but for the most part, we're finding the spec is pretty much okay, and we're just waiting for more community feedback to see if there are things we need to work on in the future. But we're not just toiling our our fingers, we're actually looking at the next set of pain points. And as you can see here, we're going to start looking at what we call sort of the life cycle of event delivery from, from beginning to end. Okay. Now, cloud events helps you deliver the event from the producer to the, to the consumer itself. But in, in order for that to actually get started, what has to happen is the consumer first has to discover what event producers are out there and what the events are that they actually do produce. Okay. So what we're going to be doing is working on a discovery API spec, and that's going to allow producers to advertise that they're out there and what the events are that, that people can subscribe to. So a consumer will then hit a discovery endpoint, find out what, there are, what events are out there, who produces them, uh, how they can be delivered, you know, different transfer protocols, what are the different subscription options, do they support filtering, stuff like that, and then, of course, how to actually subscribe, okay? After that, then comes the actual subscription itself. Now, if the protocol that they chose does not actually have a native subscription type mechanism built into it, like for example, HTTP does not, we will then, as part of the subscription API spec, define how the subscription should happen, right? So for example, HTTP will define the REST operation to do the subscribe, okay? And inside there, you're gonna specify all the things you might expect, right? Which events you wanna get. If there's filtering, how to specify the filters. Um, how you specify where to deliver the events to, the format of the messages, stuff like that, as well as some APIs to actually manage the subscription, right? How do you make updates to it if you can? How do you delete the subscription? Very obvious types of things. And then of course, at the end of the life cycle, you then have the cloud event spec itself, which is gonna be used to annotate your event to figure out um, or how to do proper routing of the event to the proper destination, right? The extra metadata that's part of the cloud event spec. So that's what we're going to be looking at next in terms of lifecycle specifications to complete the complete to, to complete the complete picture around event delivery, right? So one last little spec I want to talk about is on the next slide, and that's the schema registry spec. As one of the little bits of metadata inside the cloud event spec is a uh, a URL to the schema of the event that's being transported, and people can host that pretty much wherever they want. But we realized that there really wasn't a standardization effort around the APIs of a schema registry itself, meaning how can producers talk to more than one schema registry to actually upload their schema and manage those schemas, right? Version them and stuff like that. So we thought, okay, let's see if we can do some help there. So we're defining a set of APIs mainly for producers to figure out how to talk to these schema registries to upload their schema itself, okay? Very simple little CRUD type APIs, nothing earth shattering there but it will have automatic versioning in there so that you don't have to worry about, you know, versioning numbers of the URLs to access the different versions of the schema itself. We'll help you a little bit there, okay? But in terms of actually using the schema itself, it's pretty much what you'd expect. Producers will use the schema to advertise for the consumers to use. And then the schema itself will be used to, in the serialization of the event to make sure it adheres to that particular format. Consumers can then access the schema registry to use the schema to then figure out validation, make sure they understand how to parse the schema or deserialize, I'm sorry, not parse the schema, deserialize the event into the right format and stuff like that. The same thing you'd expect even without the schema registry there. But the schema registry helps get the interop around uh, publishing and sharing of the schemas themselves. And that's the last bit of, of new things that we're working on, okay? So that's pretty much it for the cloud event side of the serverless working work group. 
So let me now hand it over to Timur to talk about the workflow stuff. All right, thanks, Doug. So serverless workflow is basically a workflow language that allows you to orchestrate microservices and events. We typically categorize workflow languages in different buckets, going from flowchart-based workflow languages, form-based, or code-based, where the actual workflow language is the underlying programming language of choice. Serverless workflow falls into to the declarative workflow language territory. So with serverless workflow being declarative, we focus on what to do and not how. So the language itself is dependent on time implementations to interpret the what and actually execute uh, the instructions that we put in our workflow definitions. With serverless workflow, you can define uh, workflows <laughs> using JSON or YAML, and the language itself is completely defined using JSON scheme. Now, we have to look, many different workflow languages exist out there, and we have to look typically at the target domains of the workflow language to pick which one we want to choose. For serverless workflow, we of course focus on the business domain, meaning that you can express your workflow definitions with terms and, and knowledge that you gain, have in your business domain. But at the same time, serverless workflow targets the serverless uh, technology domain, meaning we can also express things like functions, events, retries, and things like that are common in the serverless or microservices applications as well. So serverless workflow tries to uh, merge and allow you to write workflows using both your domain or business no, uh, logic, as well as the domain of serverless technology as well. Now, one advantage of serverless workflow is that it's completely agnostic, meaning as we, as we uh, mentioned earlier, the workflow definitions or the, the JSON or YAML that you write to express your workflow logic is not uh, programming language dependent. At the same time, the workflow data that is uh, being executed and that you can update and, and uh, work with during workflow execution is also expressed in JSON format. And as such, serverless workflow is a domain-specific um, declarative lang workflow language we, which can be um, executed on many different runtimes in different programming languages. At the same time, you can take the particular uh, runtime in any language and deploy it on multiple cloud platforms. So it's really agnostic from any type of technology that is underlying, that is executing the actual workflows itself. <laughs> when we talk about serverless workflow, we want to compare it with what's out there already. And the typical comparison of what it is right now, or what serverless workflow is, is with things like AWS step functions or Google Cloud workflow, or even a lot of comparisons toward, towards uh, BPMM as well. And this table kind of shows you uh, some of the uh, features of the languages and how it compares uh, between them. So these, there are, of course, a lot more features uh, that exist, but these are kind of like the core features that we looked at, we'll look at when we think about orchestrating microservices as events. So serverless workflow currently is somewhat of a superset of the other declarative being step functions and, and, and cloud workflow, but is a subset of BPMN2. Uh, but again, it focuses on the feature set specific to its target domains being uh, orchestration of, 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 of microservices as events. Now, one thing about serverless workflow that we really try to do is we try to focus on standards. And you can see here some of the uh, standards and technology-wise that we're, we're really enforcing within our workflows. And of course, one being cloud events. Now, this is two advantages. On the one hand, when you're writing your workflows, you can utilize the standards and actually to describe, again, if you remember the what or what your execution or orchestration should be rather than some proprietary or hard-coded or predefined uh, function, functionality that you might only uh, have available. But at the same time, it also has the runtime implementations to start thinking about standards and uh, allow you to, to, to really be comfortable with the runtime implementation uh, of serverless workflow in terms of longevity and things like uh, open source and specification things and, 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 and kind of enforces that side as well. Now, and besides the just of being agnostic and, and things like that, 
With serverless workflow, we also took a look at the logical structuring of the workflow definition itself. The workflow definition is composed of three parts. The first one is your control flow logic block, which includes um, the language structure such as sync, async, invocations, looping, branching, parallel execution, the typical stuff that you think of when you think of workflow language and, and using workflows in general. But at the same time, uh, we also have event definitions and event definitions are completely reusable pieces. So you can define your events that are supposed to be consumed or produced by the workflow, either with inside your workflow definition, or you can completely expose it as a service or, or, or write it somewhere else. So multiple workflows can actually access them and reuse those definitions. We for enforce cloud event specification here, of course, but the source or the actual producers of those events could be many different things in the end. The third part of the workflow definition is function definitions. And those again, just like event definitions are completely reusable between workflows. They can be defined inline as well we'll see in the demo later, or you can expose them as a separate file and, and treat them uh, uh, or allow them to be used by multiple workflows definitions if, if you wish. The function definitions define some invocation of a service or some invocation of a particular expression. So through function definition, you can easily uh, utilize things like open API, gRPC, or you can even define a container that you have you want to ex actually execute an image on or something during workflow execution. Um, the serverless workflow also defines some of an ecosystem. So not only do we define the core language and the structure of the language, if you have documentation and things like that. Um, uh, that describes every little piece of, of, of uh, the workflow language that you can use. We also include things like a VS Code uh, extension that helps kind of developers get started. We include a set of uh, SDKs, which currently they, they're, they're there to parse uh, workflow definitions, validate them and things like that. We currently have them in Go in Java. We just added the .NET SDK, and we're currently also working on a TypeScript SDK. Um, in addition to that, just as again, to get started on our website, uh, we have an online editor where you don't really need a particular uh, like VS code or idea or some sort of programming uh, language type of editor to actually start uh, getting started to define your workflow definitions and also to visualize them uh, via a uh, simple UML diagrams as well. Now, even though serverless workflow is fairly new, uh, we have uh, received uh, a lot of interest from different people, different people from the community. And we currently have a small but very healthy community. We have a couple of partner projects, as you can see here within CNCF, and that it's very important to us to grow those relationships and integrations with them. Uh, we do uh, have currently open source collaborations with multiple companies, uh, as you can see. And there are already a couple of, well, Java-based right now, open source implementations of the serverless workflow specification and more are coming in the future in different languages. Like I said, currently we only have the Java guys that are predominant in this space, it seems, currently. Now, as far as the project release roadmap, um, we currently have uh, released just <laughs> this month, uh, version 0.6. Um, we're planning a 0.7 uh, release uh, this summer. And once we do that, uh, hopefully we can start targeting version 1.0 of the specification, uh, at least a release candidate one by uh, November of this year. That's currently our plan. And it highly also, of course, depends on the community effort and, and contributions as well. All right, so now that we talked about serverless workflow, let's do a little demo. It's just going to be very simple, but it is going to, I think, show uh, how to get started and, and kind of what workflow and serverless workflow in general can bring to you. So for that, uh, I wanted to kind of start it off and say uh, the demo is going to be three very simple services written in different programming languages. So first service here is going to be a, a Node service, Node.js. And let's get it started. For that, we can say npm run local. So we will run this on localhost. However, you can easily, you know, imagine this being deployed on any container or cloud platform, per se, 
sake for the demo, we will run this locally. So we can actually curl this service. Oh, and actually let me pipe it through JQ so we get a pretty output. And you can see our Node.js service just gives us a little piece of JSON saying invoked Node.js function. And that's it. Our second service that we want to run is a Go service. And we have a handle.go. So we're just gonna get that started. And this service is going to run on 8081. Whoops, sorry. And let's test it if it's up and running. We can issue a post to it. And you can see it also returns a little piece of JSON called invoke go function. That's it, that's really all. The third service that we have is uh, our little Java service, which uh, currently this, this is running on Quarkus, but you can run it on Spring Boot or any of the Java runtimes or, or environments that you want to run it. And let's see, this has already started and our Java service runs on port 82 and it has a little endpoint of greet, I think. And here we see we have invoked it via curl and it says Java function invoked our Java function. Now, the idea behind this is to really show you that you want, we want to with serverless workflow orchestrate microservices. And here we have three different functions. They're written in three different languages. They can be really deployed anywhere you want or live where, you know, not on localhost, of course. And now <laughs> our assignment is to orchestrate it in some way. And for that, we can start using uh, our serverless workflow. So for this, we're going to use the Red Hat Cogito uh, current uh, open source implementation for this there, like we saw others, but let's go ahead and look at the little project I've created here. And let's do this so I can actually see things. Whoops, sorry. Now, this is a very simple Java Maven project. And as you can see, there is no Java sources. There is no particular Java-based objects. A lot of runtimes that you see out there, especially workflow runtimes, kind of enforce you to use a particular programming language, especially for the data model. Serverless workflow, you're using JSON. So even though this is a Java um, project, being a Java runtime, the way we express orchestration is completely uh, agnostic to any programming language itself. And another thing that we see here, I don't have a workflow yet, but we'll define it together. However, one thing I've defined is little open API definitions. And if you see here, we can see in our VS code, we can generate a little open API uh, and you can see our, our, in this case, our Go service, which we just invoked during uh, curl. It has uh, one endpoint and just slash, and we can invoke it as well. The same thing we have defined here is for Java service and our node service that we currently evoke. So when I write my workflows or when you write your workflows, you don't have to know much about where the service is. If it needs a certain authentication, you don't have to define that inside your workflow definition. You use open API, which is a standard for that, and you let the runtime engines figure out how to actually uh, invoke uh, those services during workflow execution, the way you define them with a standard definition rather than something proprietary or custom. So now what we have left to do is really start writing our workflow. So for this, I'm going to create a new file and it's going to be, let's say, um, my workflow and like we said, we can define them in JSON or YAML. In this case, let's go ahead and define it in um, JSON. And now before I get started, I want to just show real quick with uh, VS Code, I have the serverless workflow plugin installed already. But it, it, if you work with VS Code and serverless, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to install this little extension as well. The reason for that, it gives you things like code completions and code hints and things like that to allow you to easier uh, define your workflow using the serverless workflow language. So let's go ahead. Our ID of the workflow, it's a, a unique identifier where let's call it just simple workflow. And we'll see what uh, why this is important to define the ID later. Let's give it some sort of version of 1.0. 
and let's give it a some descriptive name our simple orchestration all right so far so good right so now we have to tell the runtime engine through a workflow definition well okay when you start this workflow where do you actually start and let's call our starting point again let's say start or orchestration so this is some starting point you know, the next thing we want to do is actually do the what uh, part of the workflow, which is define the control for a logic for this. So Rolls workflow gives you an array called states. Each state is a single building block that you define that, that, that defines how the control flow logic should, uh, what, what, what actually the workflow should do. So in our case, let's define a state and we have a name which kind of has to match here. So start matching this state means that this particular workflow state is going to be the first one executed when this workflow execution happens. Now, another thing with serverless workflow that you have, we have different types of states and currently we have nine of them. So for the one that we want to use, which is basically just invoking uh, functions or, or microservices, we have this thing called an operation state. And an operation state has actions actions actually define invocations of some services that you want to invoke so in our case let's give our first uh, action a name and let's call it invoke go function and we can give it a function ref and our function ref let's just call it uh, go function and that's it and we have of course, to define two more of those because we want to invoke three services. Now, the default execution of uh, the services in actions is uh, sequential, but you can see you can define an action mode parameter where you can also or actually also say that these services or invocations should be completed in parallel. So let's here we want to go and Java and that's it. And at the end, what we have to do is we have to tell our workflow engine that once it has executed those hey, functions, what? yeah? Uh, the last one you said node function, it should be Java function, right? Oh, sorry. Yep. Thank you, you so much. Yep. Uh, all right, so, <laughs> thank you, <Doug. laughs> Yeah, and basically uh, to tell our runtime, once it, uh, this state is executed or three uh, functions are uh, invoked, we want to end workflow execution. And as you can see so far, this is all, domain specific. We didn't use any programming language. We didn't use any with uh, ways or proprietary ways. We basically, once you, this is human readable. And once, when you read it, you can actually figure out what's, and you can of course use your domain specific language to define everything within workflow execution. Now that we have defined our state, we do have to tell the runtime a little bit more about the functions that we want to actually invoke. So for that serverless workflow gives you a little functions array. And now the name uh, of our function definition, let's, we have, it references the function ref parameter. So let's call, call this a go function. And our operation, at this point, a lot of workflow languages give you some custom parameters, proprietary things, a set of things that you can do. With serverless workflow, you basically use open API. So for us, this means that we want to actually reference our API definition for a Go service. So we say Go service.json. And within the Go service JSON, we want to uh, use its unique operation ID for the type of uh, uh, service that we want to go use. And this operation ID here is called Go. So this is it. With this, we have told the runtime to use the open API definition to learn how to invoke this service. And when it invokes it, it should use this particular unique operation ID, telling it exactly what to invoke during workflow execution. Now, same thing, we want to use again three times. So for this, we want to reference this one and we have node service.json here and the unique operation ID is node. Where is my workflow? All right. And for the Java function, we have our Java service open API definition here. And 
Java service and our operation ID is simply just Java. So let's go with that. And this is it. This is our workflow that's going to first invoke our Go function, then our Node.js function, and then our Java function. Now, one of the things that's also important here, if you look at our, for example, Node service, we have for this particular path or service what to invoke, we use get. Now you can change this to post without ever affecting your workflow definition. So having this uh, open API definitions, or we also support gRPC, or even we can invoke some certain reusable expressions, having them defined like this really allows you to change things around dynamically, depending on what the services, or even the services that might host this open API definition, they can change and you don't really have to change your underlying workflow definition itself. All right, so that's it. So let's go ahead and uh, start our little workflow um, application. So what this particular runtime is going to do, this Java runtime is going to read our workflow definition and our open eye def definition is going to start generating things for us. The first thing that is going to generate is the actual code uh, to invoke uh, the open API stuff uh, that's using the open API as the case in different languages. And then it's going to actually parse our workflow definition and generate some particular code that actually is going to expose our workflow as a service. And the particular endpoint of the service that is going to expose for us is determined by the ID parameter. So for example, the service that we have right now running, and this is running uh, just to show you in port 8083, <laughs> just to be different from the other ones, it's going to be a localhost 8083, and in this case, slash simple work. All right, so let's go ahead and we can actually run this. So for that, I, let's see if I have actually, uh, this is bad. if I can actually have the curl for that. Nope, I guess I don't, which let's try it one second. I have a curl prepared for this and uh, KubeCon EU2021, so I don't have to mess it up. <laughs> there it is. And I might have to change it a little bit depending on our definition. So let's go ahead and paste this. Now let's see our endpoint if it, is still true, this is slash simple, but for us, our ID is simple workflow. So let's change that around. All right, so when I do this, we're going to, uh, should be getting an instance of a workflow. Our workflow is going to execute our uh, little three functions in this particular order. So let's go ahead and do that. And here is our output, which is the output of the workflow, its uh, results and includes the three uh, outputs of our services. So the results of each of the service invocation gets merged with uh, these um, workflow state data. And the final, after the three results are merged into the state data, the workflow produces this particular result. So that's it for the little demo. I hope it, it really helps you guys start, understand how easy to get started and start orchestrating services no matter where they live and how they're defined using particular standards like open API and gRPC. So that's it for the demo and I'm gonna start sharing back our presentation. All right. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining our talk and, and being here. Uh, Doug and I would really like to thank you. And here you can find some more information information about both cloud events and serverless workflow. And for cloud events, specifically, uh, they have, uh, cloud events has weekly calls, Thursdays as, at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And you can find all the information you need uh, to join those calls on the serverless workflow uh, GitHub repository. I mean, cloud events, <laughs> sorry. Same thing for serverless workflow. We, uh, it has uh, calls on Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and you can also find uh, that information on, on GitHub as well. Uh, on behalf of, of Doug and I, I would like to thank you all uh, for joining and uh, we will stay around for any questions. Thank you very much.